would um, try to integrate some of what we began to address this morning, which was about free speech but it, and the connection to freedom. And so I thought maybe we could talk about the loss of freedom that comes with polarization. And how do we manage polarities so that we don't only identify the problems but also what are ways that we bring people um, into a shared reality? And um, I think that it's a good entry point that would allow for Yuval to talk for again from the macro level and for me to tell you, there's, you know, couples therapy is a very good way to learn about polarization. Uh, there's no two people who can be more <laughs> unable to hear each other sometimes than people who once thought they could tell each other everything. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my training ground, is working with conflictual escalating couples and uh, they cancel each other out every sentence. It's very simple. Oh, when, when I think about polarization and what we heard this morning about the ability, I mean, the ability to listen to people and the ability to talk to people, I think the key um, understanding from a historical perspective, we're talking about the large scale level, is that when you can't talk, the only thing left to do is fight. That should always be borne in mind. If, if we are in a position, I can't listen to them, or I'm not willing to let them talk, it means that you're choosing to fight. Because that's the only other option which is left open. And, you know, in, in, in a couple, then you can get a divorce, maybe, in this situation. But in a country, what do you do? You can split the country, or you can have civil war, or you can have a dictatorship. Something to understand about democratic freedoms is that for most of history, large-scale democracy was simply impossible. A democracy is not something that can exist just in, at, at any situation. In most situations, democracy is impossible. Until the 19th century, we don't have any example, any example as far as I know, of a functioning large-scale democracy. We have a lot of examples of small-scale societies which function democratically, whether it's hunter-gatherer bands and tribes, or whether it's small city-states, like Athens. We don't have any example of a large-scale democracy until the 19th century, because the conditions are just not there. And one of the conditions is the ability to have an open and relatively free public discussion. Before the 19th century, you just don't have the communication and information technology to allow real life discussion of public affairs. So democracy is usually impossible. Um, when it fails, when it's not possible, again, you can have dictatorship. Dictatorship is, 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 is possible almost under any circumstances. Or you can have a civil war. That, that's also a possibility. Or again, to split the country into several parts and, and see if the people in the smaller parts can get along together. Can get along together again, listen, and talk uh, uh, with, with one another. And um, so, so the big questions, if we are to keep a democratic system, uh, to keep democratic freedoms, is whether we can still talk, which means whether I can still listen to the other side, and whether I still allow the other side to talk. Because there is also a lot of questions today, who is allowed to talk about what? And again, if, if you say to people, you're just not allowed to talk about that, that's a very dangerous gambit. That's a very dangerous move. It's think well if you prefer them to talk about it or to fight about it. Um, and I'll, I'll give an example, a very controversial example, which like is hanging in the air above many of the discussions that we had. That if you think about, let's say, take the kind of ultimate other in, in, in many of these gatherings, like the angry white man in Oklahoma, and what they think, and what they, <clears throat> and what they say. And very often people say, we don't want to listen to these people. They have been talking and talking and talking for centuries, forcing everybody to listen, and they have an opinion about everything. It's time they shut up. Because yes, they have their problems, they have their concerns. 
But so many people have been silenced for so many years, it's time for other people to speak for a change. And as a historian, I completely agree with that, except that remember why these people dominated the conversation for so many generations and centuries. Because they had the guns. And they still have the guns. So what you need to ask yourself, do you prefer them to talk or to fight? And it's actually a, 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 something that I often also hear is about the kind of fragility or vulnerability suddenly of, of, of white men. And actually, and this may also go to, to the therapy thing, finally, they are talking about their vulnerabilities and weaknesses and harm and, and whatever. And what they are being told is shut up. We've been listening to you so much. We don't want to hear you. Even when you talk about your, well, and again, it's completely just, it's completely fair because they have been talking an awful lot. And it's time to listen to other people. Except that there are the guns. It's the, again, it's, it's fair that they shut up, but it's unwise. So that's, You're talking that's the about opening enlightened self-interest. Basically, yeah. it's a version of enlightened self-interest. I'd better talk to you than have you p take out your gun. I mean, that's, okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> No, I was thinking when you talked, it's either they talk or they take out the guns, or either they talk or they fight. In a couple, they do both all the time. You know, they, t they fight and talk and yell and stonewall and, and have contempt and be defensive and be critical. I mean, it's everything that you see on the broad scale. I'm a practitioner, I'm a clinician, I'm actually... Um, but I, I have often thought that anybody who has sat with couples for thousands of hours, has, may have something to bring to the conversation about polarization. But what would you say is the opposite of polarization? Um, it's the understanding that we have a lot of things in common. We have some interests in common, we may have some experiences in common. We agree about a lot of things. Again, the amazing thing is when you look at many of the societies today that the conversation breaks down and people can no longer talk with one another, the astounding thing is they actually agree on so many things. Actually, they agree on many more things that they agreed before. If you look, say, at the ideological battles today uh, say in the Western world, they are actually um, conducted against a background of much more agreement than in previous eras. But people don't see all the things that they agree about. So I w in, in our language, in systemic uh, thinking about relationships, the opposite of polarization is complementarity. And complementarity, when it breaks down, becomes polarization. And what makes it break down is actually the inability of people to hold the complexity of a, of a subject. It can be raising children, it can be managing money, it can be um, f you know, the free speech that T Toby was talking about earlier. Um, and None, nobody at that panel would want people to be excluded or shot or, you know, they actually agree. But f a complex subject is a subject that cannot be responded to with a either or, which means that people need to be able to hold the ambivalence. The people need to be able to hold the, com the contradictory parts of the issue. And polarization is actually when you split the ambivalence. And now you become the proponent of half of the equation, and I become the proponent of the other part of the equation. And I keep talking about how it is dangerous, and it doesn't make people feel safe, and it's uncomfortable, and it could hurt someone, and it could lead to a killing three steps later. And you keep talking about how the three steps later are so far. That was kind of the, 
uh, the conversation earlier, and, and, and why should I stop here for something that could maybe happen there but hasn't really happened? And I emphasize the importance of being able to talk, and you emphasize the importance of having to be careful, as if the one who wants to talk doesn't care about careful, and the one who wants careful doesn't care about talk. You can bring this structure to every subject that is complex, and where people do not know how to hold the complexity, which means to hold the contradictory part of the question inside of them, and so they project one piece of it onto the other, and now you become the proponent of only that. And every conversation, and that's the problem of polarized conversations, and I think it's no different in large groups than in two people, is that every time I say something, I so completely deny the thing that you represent or stand for that I actually reinforce your position. And we say you are impossible without noticing that what I do makes you even more impossible. It's a figure eight. The more I say what I say is gonna make you actually say the opposite thing of what I would actually want from you, but I am the one who is actually provoking for you to say that, to say that very thing, which then makes me say, this is it. Anybody ever seen this situation? <laughs> I don't think it's that different when I sit with, you know, I used to do groups of blacks and Jews in America. I used to do groups of Israelis and Palestinians. It's a similar thing. So polarity management, actually, which is a model, and um, is Claire here? Because she was giving it to me from the field. Yeah? Yes, uh, because I can't repeat how you gave it to me from philosophy, but I will give it to you. What was interesting is that it, I, it, theology, the guy who developed it was a pastoral counselor, and so there is a, another tradition to it. But what, what is, what, how do you get out? And you get out by doing the exact opposite of what you actually normally would do, which is you start, it, imagine a square. So this is the position that says we should say everything, or we, it could be we should say everything, or we should put discipline on the children, or we should go to services on Sunday morning, whatever the value fa fight is. Doesn't, and honestly, when I say it's whatever, because I, I, the most important thing is to actually not get hooked on the subject. The topic is not what drives it. The form is what drives it. The form meaning the way the conversation goes. People could be talking about Greenpeace and South Korea and have the same conversation. It would be equally polarized. And once you let go, this is where we can't be homo sapiens. We actually cannot believe that the subject is what is driving the division. I mean, in those very particular situations. So you start not from trying to convince this person to win them over, but you start by basically t acknowledging whatever is driving why they think the way they do. So yes, of course, you don't want to have people sit in situations where hateful speech is being said or racist comments are being, of course, I, you know, because once I have actually said what you are about to say, I have freed you up to maybe think about something else for a change. Because otherwise, if I say the opposite part of the equation, you are going to play your part. I've just set it up. And after I have spoken about what is underneath, what, is, what gives the intensity to your comment, not the content of your comment, then I go to down the diagonal like this, and I go to the part of what I think we would be missing if we only looked at my part, my point of view. Because that's the next thing you're about to say. If you only pay attention to this, you're not paying attention to that. Okay, well then, I'm gonna tell you what I'm not paying attention to. And then we go to what you may not be paying attention to enough. But you don't have to pay attention to it because I'm the one who always brings it up. In every one of these conversations, you can only say half the story because the other side is systematically gonna say the other side and you know in advance what they're gonna say. These are totally predictable conversations. The most interesting moment for me this morning was when, when, uh, when Aishat said, I actually agree a lot with what you said. And I thought, now it becomes interesting. Because she's not gonna say what one, you know, she said, I'm a woman, I am black, I have my childhood, I, I, I got myself into, I'm queer, I went into uh, a, a revelation, I decided to go on social issues. And then she said, and I agree with a lot of what you said. And I said, now listen. Because you can otherwise, you could have said, I've sat in this conversation. Every one of us has sat in that conversation and because I already know what's coming. And we didn't know what was coming. And that, to me, was a moment of 
Ah, I sit straight now, I pay attention. And after you've talked about what may be missing in the other side, only then you bring up what is so great about the way you think. But the truth is that complex issues, adaptive challenges, like technology, like, the, like what is happening to communication, like what is happening to democracy, don't have a right and wrong answer. They just don't. I mean, if the more one listens to you, the more you see that you, know, you need time to even get perspective and see, did, was it good? Well, you only know that because 200 years later, you can see whatever happened. Couples therapy 101. <laughs> Escalating couples, that's one of the things you do. It's extremely challenging to help people see that what they are about to say is about to make the other person say the exact thing that they wouldn't want them to say. But that because it takes you out of the essentialist perspective. That's just who you are and that is how you think. No, I think this way when I'm in conversation with you. And that's what she was saying too. In other spaces where we are together in small rooms, we are having these conversations that you can't have in public. Remember when she said that? Because, because I, I assume she says something else. So that invites those other people to not have to do the usual. We co-create each other in polarized relationships. We basically intensify the other as well as they intensify us. I think that once you begin to think like that and it takes you a little bit out of the, these are impossible people, you can't, have a, you can't talk to them. What do you think of that? Uh, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, of course, it's extremely difficult. I mean, as, as difficult as it is to do it in, in, in couple therapy, it's obviously far, far more difficult to do it on the level of entire countries, on the level of, of the entire world. Um, Can I ask you something on yeah, that, though? Please. Because in Israel, for example, one of the most interesting conversations that is dealing, it for me, is the, the parents who lost children. Something about just connecting on the loss of a child allows the people to humanize each other before they go into conversation about occupations and walls and do you think that that is indeed a good starting point? Uh, this is a very, very small group. Yes. There is a very small group in Israel and Palestine of parents from both sides who have lost children because of the conflict and they meet and, and they talk about it and they talk about the conflict. Um, but this is an extremely small number of people. It doesn't represent at all no. what, what's happening on, on, on a large scale. Um, as much as I would like it to be a model, it doesn't, see, it doesn't seem to it's be... It's not scalable. It's, it's not scalable. Um, at present, at least in Israel, we are going in the opposite direction of becoming more and more entrenched, more and more convinced that we are 100% right, they are 100% wrong, we are, purely, we are completely pure and good, there is not even a tiny thing that is wrong about us, and they are completely evil and bad, there is not even a tiny uh, amount of justice in what they say and do. Um, and um, it's, and historically, the, the solution is unlikely to come from this kind, a again, because of the immense disparity in power, I think above all else, what happened over the last, and this is not the subject of, 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 of this talk, but it, it can it reflect on, on other uh, uh, problems in other places in the world, what happened over the last 10 or 15 years is that um, Israel just became so much stronger than it was before, that the prevailing feeling is we no longer need to talk with them because we are strong enough to simply subdue them and ignore them. So if, uh, uh, if the disparity in power is too big, then... That's what many you know, men used to do in marriage. Yeah, and, and then there is no conversation. There can only be, you know, surrender. So it's the same if you look at something like the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That, again, the invasion started, you can say, when people stopped talking and uh, Putin decided to invade. And there is a, a very famous saying that every war ends in exactly the same way. Every war ends when people talk. And this sounds very optimistic because it's, it, it, it conveys the impression, hey, we just need to talk. But it ignores something that 
people sometimes agree to talk only when they feel uh, uh, that, or, or let's say the other way around, when people feel, feel very, very powerful and strong, they don't see the point of talking. So when dealing, for instance, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, if we want to reach the negotiation table, if we want to reach a point when, 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 when talk, first of all, you need to win some victories on the battlefield. Otherwise, talking is just impossible. So a, a, again, it's, um, I don't want to kind of beautify what, what happens on large, in large-scale human societies, but uh, uh, very often, um, the, the only way to reach the, the good place of, of talking and listening is, uh, is after fighting. It's called makeup sex. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is a version of it <laughs> in the twosome. Uh, I, I think this notion of the power, I, if you look at the traditional, traditional relationships were very, uh, traditional, rela cu let's say, couple relationships, which only were, until recently, sanctioned as marriage. Um, the roles were very clear, there was hierarchy, um, and you often heard, I don't need to talk with you about this. Exact, in fact, you didn't negotiate who needs to wake up to feed the baby, and whose career matters more, and whose family are we gonna go live next to, and things were very clear. Things become more complicated when everything becomes a freaking negotiation. Now, none of it is clear. And so you need, I think in romantic relationships, the conversation is more important than ever. Um, I think it's true in family relationships altogether. N people didn't need to be able to negotiate as much because the roles were clear. You know who, could ha who had the right to demand for sex? You knew who had the right to claim the children? You knew, you know, if you want to do couples therapy in India, you never work with the couple, you work with the woman and the mother-in-law. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and that, well, I say India because that's where I've done it, but there's plenty of other places where that is the case. You know exactly where the power lies, is what I'm trying to say. It's not the masculine power always. It's the mother of the oldest son. Um, or it's the relationship, it's the loyalty of the older son to the mother. Let's put it like that. Um, so I, I think that there's a reason why there is much more escalation in the romantic relationships. And it is because for the first time, if, if I fight about it, there's a chance I may actually get it because your power has weakened. I mean, it, so if to use your metaphor, it's no longer so clear who has the power. Or the power isn't always manifest. The power isn't always, anybody who's had a two-year-old knows that. You know, the power can come from the bottom up. Yeah? No, I mean, you, you understand? It's like, it's not so obvious. You know, the person who doesn't function in a relational system has all the power. The person who keeps everybody awake at night because you don't know if they're gonna come home. The person who is depressed, the person who is addicted, the person who is driving too fast, and whatever the thing is, it's, it's um, I think that we, we could benefit from looking at relationships, the ones that we are close to. Every one of us has had some family of some sort to actually develop a much more nuanced view of power and relationships, or power and sexuality for that matter, which is what we were beginning to address yesterday. Um, yeah, I think when you look at the large scale, again, it becomes often most complicated when the power shifts. And when you think that things are actually improving at last, at last things are improving, at last people who are completely powerless, they get more power. And it's often exactly then that things become the most complicated because you need to negotiate uh, 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 again. And, so, and quite often societies, they collapse at that point at the point when things actually seem to be improving. So to take an example from, from a slightly different political field, if you look at Soviet history, so the Soviet Union collapsed when at last there was somebody who is understood that, that something is wrong with the system, we need to fix it, let's start a process of reform, and that process of reform, like it released 
these immense tensions which were, which were kept in, in a very, very tight and hierarchical way, when they tried to kind of lift a, a little of that pressure and try to reform the system, this is when it, it completely uh, uh, collapsed. And it's, it's a well-known fact in history that these times of transitions can be the most dangerous and complicated, uh, partly because people have a lot more expectations. You know, when completely repressed, you don't have expectations. When things improve, uh, you, your expectations increase dramatically. And the second thing is there is a lot more to negotiate about. <laughs> and uh, just like you said, there is a lot more. And, and also the, the, the feeling is we are now negotiating the new system. You know like how that everything? appears in couples? Hmm? It's like in a couple, the version of that is we're going on a date, it's things are nice, so I can finally have a conversation with you about all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> and then it explodes. It's, it's the expectations have suddenly, you know, it seems to be, you know, she, they, he, seem to be able to be in a good mood. Mm -hmm. Things are better. Now we can start to talk about everything that's wrong. Yeah, and, and uh, again, what supercharges it is the feeling that we are now building the new system. So if I give up now, it's not just a momentary uh, uh, loss or a mo momentary compromise. It will set the new standard for who, who knows for, for how long. So I can't compromise because we are now building the, the new system. And that makes it even more difficult. Um, and I, I, I do have to say that we, we need, even though the, 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 the uh, 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 parallels are very interesting. We need to be very, very careful also yes. not to make too close comparisons uh, because we are talking about a completely also different level of, uh, levels of violence uh, involved. Like, uh, I, I hope this is not a criticism, but like wh when, when you talked about the makeup sex and people were, were laughing, I was like cringing that, you know, it's not that they shouted at each other. They killed tens of thousands of people like the millions of refugees. So the, 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 I, I really like the kind of conversation that, that, that we have that we kind of compare the two, but we also have to kind of keep in mind that ultimately it's not really a, a couple having a domestic uh, argument. It's uh, that when, when we talk about breakup, then yes, it could be civil war. It could be major war with of refugees and, and, and tens of thousands of, 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 of people dead. Um, so it's, and, and this is an interesting kind of th theoretical question that at what point, I mean, what are the similarities between the small scale and the big scale? And when does it become kind of uh, 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 dangerous? Because you also hear in history a lot of regimes building on these similarities, like talking about the state is a family, the king or the president is the father, uh, the citizens are the children, and this sometimes goes in a very dangerous uh, uh, direction. So I think that kind of on a methodological level, we need to keep the two, like what, what can we learn from the two situations about each other, but when do we need to keep them like cl clearly separate? A very good point. I think the learning is when we see that we too get into those very polarized, similar situations with people that we are close to and live with. And that we, so it gives ourselves a view of ourselves in those, in a micro level that, but yes, no, I, I don't compare makeup. I do have a question though on this thing. Because you said it's when things improve. Um, would you think that, well, okay, my question is this, do authoritarian regimes rise, which they rise, kind of, they come and go, would, uh, because things improve or because the powers that have been in place are mostly in that sense the men of whatever the country and whatever race in that sense um, are humiliated. Now, it can be humiliated because the economic system has broken, but basically that, you know, I, I do want to understand why, it's a question we had on the first evening, why do these regimes load the feminine, the, f the feminine in the gay, the feminine in the woman, the feminine inside of them, the feminine in the boy that isn't masculine enough. There is something, and it's national socialism was this way, I and mean, militaries in, Arge in Latin America. It, it's systematic that authoritarian regimes just uh, despise 
and, and want to kill it inside of them and then want to kill it uh, around them. Yeah, I think because they identify it with weakness and the one thing they are kind of, they, they can't stand is admitting weakness, admitting a mistake, uh, admitting vulnerability. So again, and, and this is also you're, you're the same way that you kind of equate the, uh, um, the, the the country with the family. So it's also a very, very common story, common fantasy to equate the country with, a, with the body. And then uh, any thought, for instance, about the body being penetrated, God, oh, oh no, like somebody from outside would penetrate us, whether it's immigrant, whether, whether it's, it's in war, it's, it's fighting. So we always have to keep the, the state very, very strong and very uh, uh, muscular and never let anybody kind of penetrate us. So it, it also in, in this level, it, it's the level of the imagery, again, of, of the story, of the fantasy, but it also gets translated into very, very concrete actions. Um, so, and, and I think w w uh, this is kind of jumping to, to a very different uh, topic, so m maybe we come back. But part of what bothers me, and going back to the issue of talking, is how do you improve things? How do you change things without relying on, on violence? And part of my concern of too much emphasis on always on power on pa and on power relations is that if everything is just power, the only way to change things is with violence. Because it's extremely rare that people would give up, that the powerful would give up, the, up their power, except if they are forced to with violence. So if everything is power, the kind of co that we are driven towards the conclusion that the only thing we can do is 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 use power. What is the thing Vi that violence. we're not including when we? And that's and, and that's the question. So is there something which kind of can work in a different way? What is there other than than, than power? And two, again, possibilities. I, I can't say that th this is really true, but two possibilities that kind of I'm drawn to, and that you see that a lot of people are. are, are trying to go in that direction. One possibility is, again, story, storytelling. That the stories people tell, they are not just a reflection of their power and their interests. They really believe in the stories. You often, very often, he hear that like somebody, there is kind of a political argument, and somebody comes with a certain story, and the other side would say, you don't really believe that. You're just telling this story because you have some vested interest. And I'm not fooled by your story. And I'm not really listening to your story. I'm not arguing with your story because it doesn't matter at all. I'm looking at the interests behind the story. And, be, and what kind of frightens me about that is that if this is the case, the only way you can change that person is with violence. Uh, the alternative, and th 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 this is a debate, whether it's, it's true, if they really believe the story, it's not just a cover up for their interests, if they really believe the story, there is a chance, just a chance, that by listening to their story and taking it seriously and talking about it and offering them a different story or offering them a different viewpoint on their own story, they can actually change their mind. That's, that's one avenue of kind of progress which doesn't immediately go to violence. The other thing that kind of may escape this network of power is experience. Of course, power shapes experience, but the experience itself is something else. Like if you describe the entire network of power in the world, not just between humans, also physics, you kind of draw every, every uh, 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 vector of power in the universe, there is still one thing you don't understand, and that's the experience itself. You can understand the power that kind of drives somebody to, that deprives people of, of, of food. That because there is the war in Ukraine and because of this and because of that, people in uh, uh, somewhere don't have food. And then they go hungry. And you understand all that, but to understand the experience of hunger, it's, it's something else. And that's maybe another avenue for change, which is not through kind of direct push
pushing back to f using force violence is by having an experience that opens your, or your eyes to, I, I didn't know. So this, what you just described, is my definition of therapy. I mean, relationships are stories. I typically think that my goal is that people will come in with one story and hopefully they will leave with another. In couples, I think that sometimes you will find that you have been recruited for a story that you never auditioned for. <laughs> That's the, so you suddenly find yourself like a character in somebody else's plot. But the notion, this is narrative therapy. And the goal of therapy is to give people a different experience so that they can release themselves from a story which often doesn't serve them anymore or it's a constricting story. It's a story that doesn't allow them whatever it is that is holding them back, um, you know, to, to what, what was the, the, oh, it was the, the first talk in the morning about the obstacles, the restrictions that we were experiencing. So that, that is really, you know, liberating people from their, from their stories.